Support for Vietnam and Interview has been provided by Carol Gordon and the National Veteran Business Development Council, offering certification of disabled and veteran-owned businesses, with additional support from the following. Veterans often experience mental health benefits by simply sharing their stories. Moskowitz, like many young men raised in the 50s, dreamed of being a soldier. My stepdad was a 23-year Navy veteran. When Vietnam came, it was just my turn to go. Mark and his high school bandmate, Tom Marable, enlisted in 1966. I marched young and strong into the fire. We all just wanted to be John Wayne. I was moved by faith and courage, fear and desire. I never guessed that my dreams would go down so hard. Yeah, it's the changing of the guard. I raised my right hand to defend and support the Constitution of the United States. I knew that there were people who needed us and that we had to go help them. And I, I recognized that as a moment of courage. Ne never even got in a fight when I was a kid. And, uh, but I knew that I had to do this because I had seen it in the movies. Not to win medals or, or anything, anything like that there. I wanted to, to go for the United States. I wanted to go. Nobody broke my arm to join. I kick myself in the butt every day. I'm probably more angry with myself than, than anybody. What turned out to be uh, fairy tales that I grew up watching on the silver screen and listening to uh, through my forefathers, you know, that experienced previous wars. I was 28 years old. I wasn't 18 for my first visit to a, an Asian country. I've been in Asia lots of times. 
previously as a lieutenant. I wanted to test myself in my bravery. In man I wanted a rite of passage into manhood. We were all kids. Well, I remember photographs of father's war and his victory. Red, white, and blue of the eyes And in my heart there was no doubt When my time came, well, I'd fall in line I'd give it all to hear those bells of freedom ring I stepped off the plane into heat, humidity, smells, dirt. My first impression of it was uh, it stunk. Uh, it was hot. Hot. Heat, obviously. Very, very hot. It hit me like a brick. We'll step right on to the tarmac jack. Trucking and trucking and down the road. Yeah, welcome to the mom, no turning back. Trucking and trucking and down the road. Bugs everywhere and it's hot as hell. in my truck and as soon as I was out the gate and made a turn onto Highway 1, I just felt free again. I felt good when I, when I got away from the confines of the military. Okay, there was a certain freedom in that. It was an opportunity to get away from the scrutiny and the tedium. There was a beauty there that, that hid on the, the edge of the, the danger. Roadside retail, coke and pot. Trucking it, trucking it down the road. Hey, some are friendly, some are not. Trucking it, trucking it down the road. Hey, step right on, on that jack. Trucking it, trucking it down the road. Well, do the knob, no turning back. Well, do the knob, no turning back. Yeah, well, do the knob, no turning back. Well, do the knob, no turning back. Yeah, well, do the knob, no turning back. Upon arrival in Vietnam, Mark was assigned to a fire support base seven miles south of Da Nang. In a fire support base, we lived inside a tent with folding canvas cots. There, he was befriended by Vinnie Brennan. When I finally got to Vietnam, I, I tried to get in a click right away with a bunch of people that I thought were, were all right. They didn't want to have anything to do with the new guy. Uh, it was bad luck. And I made it a point later on when I became an old guy that anybody new came in, I try to be friends with right away, make them feel good, because I didn't like what happened to me. Life on the base revolved around a number of menial but important tasks. Mess duty, policing up garbage, guard assignments, and the dread burning of the shitters. Some of the men volunteered for this detail because the stench kept the lifers away, which would allow the men to have a beer or smoke a joint. The base was surrounded by a tangle of concertina wire and strategically placed observation posts, or OPs. Villages were off limits for men on the base, but some locals were permitted to provide services, like barbering, just outside the wire. They put a little hooch up outside, and, and they put a barber's chair in it, and uh, you could buy Coca-Cola and stuff. I sat down, and, and he, the fella with the, well, he was with the clippers, he did the clipping, and he took that straight razor out. There I was with a Vietnamese man at my throat with a straight razor. One night, the unit across from us got hit, and guess who was laying on the wire in the morning? The barber. He was one of the VC that attacked the uh, Fifth Marines. Mark's dad, working for McDonnell Douglas at the time, paid Mark an unexpected visit. 
they put me in the same tent with you and it would have been fine except that early that next morning the Viet Cong picked two mortar us. We met your father and I remember the first night we had intelligence reports that we were going to be attacked. We all went out in the line and we stayed out there all night long about three or four o'clock in the morning and all of a sudden they started yelling incoming, here they come, here they come, incoming. I had no control over my legs. I was shaking so much and I was cold and, I, and the round started impacting. Mark's dad dragged Mark into the nearest foxhole. What went through your mind while we were sitting in the foxhole together? What the hell am I doing here? <laughs> and they didn't follow up with a ground attack. They just shelled us. I remember the next day coming there and looking at your father and your father shaking his head and I knew he had a feeling that I'm not, I don't want to leave my son here. Well, we had a first sergeant. His name was Robert Kelleher, and he was by the book. And if you weren't by the book, you paid the price. And he used to go to me, Brennan, you're a thorn in my side. You're going to fill a thousand sandbags. Although I did a good job with the duties assigned to me, I still found time to goof around a little bit and entertain the troops. <laughs> humor. It's, it was a very special, rare item there, you know, and yours was very raw, sick, uh, but the kind I liked. <laughs> I was perpetually on a sandbag filling detail. Sandbag ski was born. I kind of I kind of liked you, but I, I didn't like you too, because you used to get us in a lot of trouble. You were different. Uh, yeah. You would do things that you weren't supposed to do, and you'd do them anyway, and get caught, and then we'd have to go fill sandbags. I mean, how many thousands of sandbags do you need to fill before you just get fed up with a shovel, a sandbag, and some sand? So we enlisted the local kids. They were always hanging on and playing looky-loo, and, and so we'd give them a few cigarettes, and they'd help us fill sandbags and uh, some of them got pretty good at it. So uh, we just had, uh, one of us would have to keep an eye on them to keep them doing it right. But uh, the rest of us could just go swimming in the bay or something while that was going on. Awesome. My unit moved up to Fubai, which is about a 60 or 70 mile relocation. And we had to go through the Haivon Pass and it was the big, like, holy mackerel ski, you turned the truck over. I ended up rolling my truck, and when we got finally to the other end, uh, Top Kelleher was there. Waskowitz, you rolled that truck. Top Kelleher again. You had a, there was a corporal warrant that he had standing out in front of him. And he had my corporal warrant. And he ripped it up, and that was it for Waskowitz at being corporal. He said, we're going to hold off on this for a while, and he just tore it in half right in front of my face. As a result of enemy actions, roughly half the vehicles in this convoy failed to reach their destinations. Uh, naturally, uh, 18, 19-year-olds have girlfriend problems. Uh, they get Dear John letters. I believe that it, had she known, had any idea of the impact that the Dear John would have caused to me that she would have waited. Bill was married, and he came to me and he says, read this letter. He, he says, well, what do you make of this? And I came, I was frank with him, and I said, Billy, I think you're going to be taken out of the ball game. I think she's getting ready to dump you. Nicest guy in the whole world, but it, he, it, he changed. He, he became very bitter towards things. I had been going steady with a girl for some time, and she sent me a letter uh, telling me that there was another guy that she was uh, with. It was uh, a feeling of total abandonment that was out of your control. I suspected between the lines that she would oppose the war, and my being over there, plus the separation from her, had a lot to do with how 
uh, why she wound up writing me that letter and leaving. They would have to go back in their fire teams and in their squads, and uh, especially especially if they had to go out on night ambushes. And uh, I would know that I have what I would have one or two guys out of that squad that they weren't really thinking of uh, what they were doing. They'd be thinking more or less of what was going on back home. It was the heaviest thing I experienced in my life. If that connection was broken, you were lost. You were lost in the zone, the war zone. With just a few weeks left on his 13-month tour, Mark signed on with Fox 2-5, a highly decorated infantry unit. I extended my tour to go out with the grunts as a forward observer and go see what was really up. On arrival in Fox Company, Mark was greeted with surly silence. Uh, I got off the truck, found my way over to the commanding officer, a young captain named Dave Brown. There was no words of welcome. I didn't know who to ask for directions. And uh, this fellow came up to me and uh, had a smile on his face. He said, you're new here. My name is Donnie, Donnie Serwick. Donnie Serwick was soon to become Mark's closest friend. In the morning, we picked up our packs and we headed out. And man, I've never humped like that before. I mean, all that infantry training back at, in the States, that was kids play. These packs were twice as heavy. We humped twice as fast and twice as far. They were returning to the spot where Fox Company had been ambushed just 36 hours earlier. I was furious because the, uh, the lieutenant uh, got them out there late. It was his fault, and uh, I kept harassing him, and he just couldn't seem to assemble his people and get out there. And then they had uh, seven wounded, in, or either seven or eight wounded, and the opposite number, seven or eight killed. 
we got into this little cluster of straw huts. A lot of the villages you would go into and you'd, that you'd, you would search, you, you might find uh, 15, 18 women and 28 or 30 kids. Dave Brown, the company commander, was fluent in speaking Vietnamese. He rounded up a couple of the old ladies and said, where did the bad guys go? What direction did they go? Oh, they hadn't noticed anything. Only an ambush about 50 yards from their houses last night that killed eight Marines, but they never heard anything. They never saw anything. I was quite angry at that point. Uh, they had really uh, ambushed and destroyed a lot of people and uh, good Marines. And uh, we went off after those enemy with, with vengeance. Fox 25's first job was to search out food stores hidden in and around the village. Excess rice was confiscated, depriving the enemy of easily accessible meals. Dave Brown chewed him out. He turned to the tank that was with us, and he said, flatten every hooch in this hamlet. I don't want anyone to ever be able to live here again. And one of the troops yelled out, Operation Crush! I literally had to dive out of the way as branches were breaking 20 feet to my right, and here comes a tank right through a brush line, just coming up in the air over the brush, and boom, right down on top of this hooch. The, the women were wailing and pleading, don't do this. I thought this was a heck of a way to run a war. I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know the full story of the ambush. It just broke my heart. Combat experience is one that's filled with a lot of noise. It's filled with a lot of, uh, because of the noise, the, the rounds going off, a lot of yelling, uh, a lot of motion. Uh, men get hurt. They get hurt right next to you. Uh, and the, the corpsmen are trying to save their lives. Uh, in, from my position as the company commander, we're not only directing the fire of our rifle platoons, we're calling in artillery, we're calling in airstrikes, we're trying to report the status to the battalion commander. We're trying to get medevacs. Captain Brown struck me as the embodiment of everything that I had been taught about or expected to uh, see in an officer. Captain Brown to us seemed uh, kind of a quiet captain. You felt the, the feeling, uh, automatic feeling that uh, this guy knows what he's doing. I had one focus and that was making sure you got home safe and that we destroyed the enemy in the meantime. And that was, was my only focus. Yet at the same time, he was a, a man who seemed genuinely interested in uh, all of us enlisted troops and would always take the time when walking by to uh, say something uh, to us about whatever it is that we were doing, whether it was to crack a joke and laugh with us or whether it was correct us about some aspect of our gear or uh, to come up and uh, slap us on the shoulder as we were getting set to go somewhere. I felt that there was a true respect and loving relationship they to me. I've always felt embraced by them. Uh, they looked out for me, I looked out for them. Very much of a mutual respect. Uh, I thought they were all a bunch of heroes and uh, we were accomplishing our missions and I'm sure they had that same kind of respect. Anytime any, any organization successful, uh, there's this mutual good feeling, uh, the, the, the people with their bosses and the, the bosses with their people and all that type of stuff. We, we were horribly successful. Helicopters provided everything for troops in the field. When they come, they come down out of the sky, it was like God coming down out of the sky to us. That was salvation to us. That was one of our only salvations. Helicopters. The blowing uh, dust and the womp, 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 womp. A little wine now and then, uh, a little bourbon now and then, uh, and, uh, and soap bottles sometimes, and uh, 
409 bottles and packed in popcorn. And we watched the uh, the net carrying the chow fall, open up, and all the chow fell down on the ground. There we were, two days in a row without food. I watched the CH. I believe a 53, a big one, come in one time, and we knew there was beer on that. If we got two beers a month, at the most, we were lucky. Great big net hanging there, and all we could see was beer in that net. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of cases of beer coming for the company and other companies. And it crashed. And I think there was more hearts broken that, that day than the firefight that we were in the day before that. We operated so far out into the hinterlands, uh, it was designated a free fire zone. That meant for us, if anything moved, we could shoot it. It wasn't supposed to be there, period. Unfortunately, the Vietnamese people, land was handed down through generations, and it was a sacred kind of thing. So one of our duties was to round up locals, put them on helicopters, and get them the heck out of there because we're moving through this valley and we're going to sweep it clean. Saddle up, lock and load, select a switch on rock and roll, advance on line, recon by fire, grenades and cans with fish and wire, blooper rag, M16, Pookie Hewitt, and thick wing. Unlike the Viet Cong, who relied on guerrilla tactics, the NVA would sometimes challenge the Marines head-on. On one occasion, Fox's sister company, Hotel Company, walked into a U-shaped ambush, got pinned down, and were taking casualties. They radioed Fox Company for support. By the time Fox Company arrived, the battle had been raging for hours. What was a significant event was, was the battles we, when we could locate and find and uh, engage the enemy and then go to it like a bunch of Marines. When we came through the tree line, we were immediately taken under fire by the enemy and this had an intensity unlike anything I had seen before. This was a set piece battle. These guys were here and they were not leaving and they were fighting for their ground, just like we wanted them to. They had a series of connecting bunkers with radio and telephones connecting the bunkers. We had to bust through to link up with Hotel Company. And in Marine Logic, we set off right into the middle of the fighting, going through the jungle like that, kind of shoulder to shoulder, just blasting everything in front of us. Do you remember Sergeant Marshall? I could hear him coming. He had the whole platoon in assault, singing the Marine Corps hymn. How threatening. Can you imagine being an enemy and having that sound come at you? Uh, you now know why the Scotsmen play, play their bag, bagpipes. Suddenly we come through an opening, and as I'm looking at it, there was a little rock wall of, of, of little bricks, and one of the bricks just plops out. And I go, what the heck? And then a rifle barrel sticks out through that hole, and then all hell broke loose. The guy on my right was shot by the AK-47, and I watched him be blown backwards, land on his shoulders with his feet in the air, both hands clutching his chest. He died in our arms. There was nothing we could do. There was one enemy soldier who would pop out the back door and throw three or four grenades, Dennis Cadigan had rounded 
the bunker, and he was about 10 feet from the back door as they all came running out, eight of them. And they all met the same fate. The battle continued well into the next day, when finally the NVA pulled out, disappearing off into the jungle. Fox Company, uh, during my uh, command, uh, well, we had 155 casualties. Uh, to my knowledge, we had 27 men killed. Part of me died. Part of me died. That, that was my brother. And part of me died when he died. I guess it was a F-16 coming in and dropping some rounds on a ville that we had just come through. And the rest of our outfit was still walking through that ville. First thing I came across was a rib cage. Stepped over that, stepped over a couple boots, a couple legs. Uh, they'd wiped out quite a few of our guys that were on the tail end of our, our line. I remember uh, throwing a body on top of a pile of bodies right after a firefight when the chopper came in to take them. And I remember it rolling down the, little, the pile of 1011 that was already there and having to pick them back up and put them back on the, on the poncho and get them back up in there somehow. Having guys who I was close to be gone in a flash was very disconcerting and made me in part want to withdraw from other people. At first I, I would kind of say, oh no, who? Who? And if you, uh, if you had died, I would have said the same thing over your body that you probably would have said to me. You know, wow, that's too bad and, and I'll miss him, but thank God it's not me. At first, I'd, I, I would get mad at that individual. Even though he was dead or seriously wounded, I would get mad at that in, individual, saying to myself, kind of talking to him, saying, what, why you? What, what did you do? And then very sad and hurt. My first experience of someone whom I was close to dying was uh, in an ambush uh, one night that uh, I was supposed to be the machine gunner with the squad that got hit but my friend told me that he would uh, go with that squad. I could uh, go with the other one that was setting up an ambush closer by. And as I uh, set up, I watched that other squad get hit uh, uh, about a mile away. After a while, you see so many guys get killed. So many, you see so many uh, people that, that are gone in, in a matter of a second. And when I got there, I uh, came around the tank that we had been trailing down to the site and there I found my friend uh, shot through the head and uh, burnt uh, uh, almost completely by a, uh, a Willie Peter uh, phosphorus grenade. Some guys made tight relationships. That's why it affected them when they would lose someone. Only luck, only luck could prevent a person from getting uh, uh, injured. And if he wasn't skillful, uh, he was almost a hundred percenter. Were you ever afraid in Vietnam? Ha! I was scared uh, quite a bit. I was scared. Every moment I was in Vietnam, I was scared. I was always scared. I knew it could happen tomorrow. It could happen to me. I was scared one time. Two moments of greatest terror were in the middle of that September 29th firefight when my gun double fed jammed and I had uh, a uh, VC pop up over the edge of the trench and spray me with 30 rounds from an AK-47, every one of which missed. Praise God. In the position I was in, I couldn't show fear. I felt it'd be uh, like a complete demoralization of my platoon. As scared as they was, they would be more scared knowing they didn't have uh, somebody to actually go to to lead them. When you get shelled, by artillery or, or mortars or rockets. It's the same in every war, the, the sheer terror. Fox Company was positioned to block NVA infiltration routes toward Da Nang, 20 miles to the northeast. One day, Fox Company would observe enemy movements. And there were always plenty to be found, by the dozens, by the scores, and sometimes by the hundreds. 
Other days, they patrolled the bush in order to flush out the enemy. Along the way, we'd run into plenty of booby traps. Uh, you might have a 500-pound bomb buried in the ground with a small bomb on top of it, uh, uncleverly hidden, so it would be intended to be found. There'd be bouncing Betty mines. You'd step on it, and when you picked your foot up, it would spring up to about waist level and explode. A booby-trapped ammo can was responsible for ending Dennis Cadigan's tour. I remember how brave he was, as typical of uh, one of the fine people we had in Fox Company. A very outgoing type person, uh, and a very, very extremely good machine gunner. If there was any weapon I would want that man to carry, it, it would be the M60 machine gun. There was a, a new tro a troop that just arrived, um, and he suspected this one ammo box may be booby-trapped. And um, Dennis was so typical, he didn't want the new person to get hurt, so he volunteered to um, open the box. I think he feels it was his job to go do this. And he, he did so with his rifle, and he extended his rifle out, and there was a much larger charge uh, that was in the, the uh, ammo box. He got hit in the facial area in the head, and he, he lost his eyesight. That was a very uh, powerful part of my uh, experience because as I laid there, I knew I was hurt. I knew I uh, could die, but I also thought to myself, I'm out of this hellhole, I'm out of here. And that, that was a, a great, great, great loss to the platoon, the company. Everybody knew him. Basically, I didn't hate the enemy. When I got up to Fox Company, and we really uh, were engaged with the enemy a lot of times, I treated the enemy as being the other guy on a football field who, in one moment, you're supposed to knock his head off. He's down, and you have scored a touchdown. You reach down, you pick up his hand, and you help him up. He's another person. And I wanted to know about him personally. I wanted to know him about anything I could learn as far as intelligence goes. But he was out of the war. He was surrounded by a bunch of Marines. One skinny little Vietnamese enemy was surrounded by a bunch of uh, uh, mean Marines. Uh, my God, if I was him, I'd be scared to death. And I didn't want him to be scared to death. He, he was out of the war. His number had come up, and that was the end of it. So I, uh, I respected the enemy, and, um, and, and they were a hell of a good enemy, I might say that. I love the kids in Vietnam. If we had a purpose over there, it was to give them a better life and let them uh, see a more peaceful, tranquil world than uh, they had known while they, were, while they were being a kid. A little kid who was selling soda at Liberty Bridge when I uh, was first in country in the first month. Uh, and I marveled at the fact that this kid seemed so cheerful and bright when we were in the midst of an area of operations which I had already seen uh, could get a little uh, scary. Them being over there in a war zone is a, a rather heart-rendering type of thing because many of them got hurt. I basically remember the kids in the Vils, let's say, after a, a napalm attack. I remember the kids laying there, screaming. It was very hard to adjust to seeing kids like this, uh, full of disease, full of flies, uh, ne never ever had a bath or didn't know what soap was or any kind of uh, things to clean their bodies up. We had been uh, set up in a perimeter and some kids came up talking to us and the next thing I heard was a shout. I turned around and the kid was uh, running and he had reached into a pack and he had two grenades in his hands. And one of the guys said, stop, stop. And the kid kept running and he fired a burst over his head and the kid just ran faster and dropped the uh, hand grenades as he went over a paddy dike. And it was a shame to see him like this. And uh, you would want to help him, but you couldn't. You had a job to do, and uh, the job you were doing, you did. When pressed, the NVA were skilled at covering their tracks. They'd quickly dig a hole, they'd bury their weapons and their uniforms, and make it look like a grave, and they'd put on civilian clothes and just hang around and pretend to be a local farmer. 
we started digging up fresh graves and we would find their uniforms and weapons. Then they one-upped us and put a body in it. So we'd dig up fresh graves and remove the corpse and continue digging in the, in the muck and mire underneath it. The stench would permeate your skin and you could smell it for days. And uh, we could wash, it would wash with soap and water. It didn't do any good. The military rewarded those who extended their tours by granting 30 days free leave anywhere in the world. So I was told, okay, uh, next chopper out, get on it, ski. So I hopped on a helicopter, flew to Da Nang. Within 48 hours from the battlefield, I was home and sitting at my parents' uh, dinner table. And I kept smelling this obnoxious smell and and then I noticed it was my hands. They still smelled of death from the battlefield. My dad's 23 years in the Navy, retired. I wanted to talk to him about my veteran experiences, about being in war. He really wasn't interested. And my mom pipes in and says, Oh, Mark, let's not talk about all that stuff. You're home for Christmas. You're here right now. Let's let's just talk about that. They wanted to pretend it didn't exist, and let's just smile and have Christmas dinner. So we had Christmas dinner. My two brothers had these tiger-striped pajamas. It was exactly the same tiger-striping camouflage pattern that the Korean Marines wore in Vietnam. And there's my two brothers, and they're opening their presents, and they got a G.I. Joe action set. And there's my brother uh, with the Jeep and a little trailer, and my other brother with a searchlight and a couple soldiers, and there was an American flag. They handed me the flag so I could hold the flag over the battlefield, and then they proceeded to crash the Jeep and wreck it and have the guys go flying out, and they're laughing and making bomb sounds, and that was Christmas. Around this time, Mark extended for yet another tour of duty. So my 30 days in the world is over. I'm back in the Nam uh, and rejoined Fox Company. And some guys, like yourself, as far as I'm concerned, just out in another time warp to go actually two or three tours from experiences of the Second World War and the mental illnesses that occurred, uh, that this guy's out there if he wants to go back. And if you survived two, you could go back again. I mean, that to me, to look back now, that was absolutely absurd, that they would actually allow you to be able to do that. After nearly two years of frontline duty, Mark's belief in his own invulnerability came into full bloom. Operation Mead River was a huge airlift, and we entirely encircled a large enemy unit. We knew darn well there was a whole bunch of them able to see us from the other side, hidden in the foliage. It was really pretty close maybe 75 yards or so, uh, maybe even closer than that. Throughout the day, uh, a sniper would open up and bing, bing, and a, a little dirt would kick up next to your head or something, and you go, that son of a bitch has me pegged. He got my number. It was one hot afternoon. We were all taking a break there, laying there for a while. We, well, actually, we, we were set in there for a while. We were running short on supplies. One of those supplies we were running short of was toilet paper. I was talking to Mark, he was always, which he always come over to me and would sit down and talk about what was going on and what we thought was going to happen. So I had to go relieve myself. So finally he just got up and walked away. And so I said, yeah, well, I'm just going to sit here and rest a little bit. I uh, went uh, a few yards away behind some bushes and dropped my drawers. And I go, well, man, what am I going to do now? And I looked at the bush next to me, and it had these big... These these big leaves, and I said, oh, that'll do nicely. So, uh, in fact, it did serve the purpose nicely. And it reminded me 
of some of the pictures I had seen in Catholic grade school. Next thing I hear, uh, some of the guys in my platoon, they're, all, they're cracking up and they're laughing. I'm saying, what the hell are you laughing at? I found a string and I took one of these leaves and it had a stem on it, like a maple leaf. And I turned around and looked and here comes Mark. And he was bare ass, he had, he had no clothes on. I grabbed a piece of bamboo, whacked it to a point uh, with a machete. I was now Adam in the Garden of Eden. <laughs> and he had tied leaves <laughs> from trees in his front and in his back. The guys on watch are a little tense. Uh, this is a, a, a tight situation because the guy kept popping off rounds at us. Well, I just run up on top of this parapet and I start yelling in Vietnamese all sorts of curses and challenges. I run down the embankment, out in front of our troops, out on the sand on the sandbar. All around our perimeter, through our perimeter, through our lines. <laughs> I'm telling them uh, my exploits with their mother and uh, how many enemy soldiers I've killed, and I challenge any warrior to come here and fight me man to man. People would just scatter and they, would, they didn't even want to go near them. <laughs> I'm recreating the scene from, you know, every old Western we've ever seen or every war movie. They thought he had finally lost it. He cracked. <laughs> but he did bring a, a hell of a laugh to everybody there. They're, they're belly laughing and pointing and calling me names, telling me what an idiot I am. I'm eating it up. I'm the show off. I'm the clown. I'm doing this Watusi dancing. And it's, it kind of struck me. Maybe I'm overdoing this a bit. Maybe this is really dumb. Wouldn't this be a messed up way to get killed? I mean, sent home with a fig leaf? Five days of R&R &R in Bangkok, Thailand could not have come too soon. <laughs> Mark spent his last few weeks in country with Echo Company and has few memories of that time, except that, in his words, there was a lot of blood. Mark was visiting a fire support base when, one evening, an NVA sapper platoon partially overran the garrison. During the battle, Mark fought through enemy lines to rescue eight trapped Marines, but was finally himself shot and left for dead. The next morning, as fighting continued, Mark was pulled from the field by his friend, Sergeant John Hare. Highly decorated and heading for home, now Sergeant Waskowitz was to face six months of surgeries and rehabilitation, after which he received his honorable discharge. We really saved uh, a lot of lives, mainly because of you, and so a deep respect, Mark, for you. The combat experience forges a powerful sense of camaraderie. In this war, they called it being tight. I don't know where the word ever came, came from or whoever started that being, being tight, but it, it, it fit the, what was actually happening to us. It, you just kept pulling together and pulling together and pulling together. No one knows how it feels to be working side by side. Counting days, monsoon mud, no one knows except for you. 
No one knows how I feel With my brothers all around me They keep me laughing, keep me high No one knows except for you the camaraderie and the feeling of how deep uh, an intimacy could be achieved with a fellow human being, I don't think I've ever forgotten. No one knows how this feels In the jungle every step Here's a wager with the devil And no one knows except for you And I remember the black uh, kid that, that saved my life. He was in the process of saving. He saved one life, and he definitely saved my life, because I was immediately going out to, to pull that first lieutenant in, a foot, foot and a half. He couldn't have stuck his, his head up from behind that tank more than, uh, more than a foot. And he took that round just faster than you can spit, right in the neck. No one knows how it feels. Hell breaks loose, bullets fly. That one definitely stays with me for the rest of my life. Dying and crying. No one knows you. Being tight meant dependability. It meant oneness. It meant that I could trust those guys with my life, with anything. That was tight. You're my brothers, you're my friends, like I'll never have again. And I'd die for if I was called, no one knows except for you. No one knows how it feels, heading home with solemn thighs. No one knows except for you. Most guys counted the days having calendars on their helmets or uh, uh, notches on a piece of wood. A favorite time in Vietnam that I like to remember. Oh, it was the day I left. <laughs> uh, got on that airplane and everybody was quiet and it, it took off and it, it got up and nobody said a word until the pilot came on and said we have cleared Vietnamese airspace and there was a roar and a cheer and that was the greatest time that I had in Vietnam was leaving Vietnam. People just don't understand what it was like when we came home. It changed uh, a lot of guys a lot of different ways. I went to the VFW and they told me well you're I wanted to be an associate member. Uh, it's not a real war. When I came back, I was a fully confident, successful Marine officer. Uh, I even denied being in Vietnam a couple of times because uh, I was ashamed. They, everybody had said that we had lost the war, and, and, and I sat back and I remember every battle we were in, we won. Many Vietnam vets still carry a lot of bitterness and pain about their service in Vietnam. We got the Royal Shaft. And we felt, uh, well, at least when we came home, that would end, and it didn't. People that asked, they would find out, they knew I was crazy. they said, say, you're, you're crazy. Uh, you're a Marine? And I, yeah, I'm a Marine. Post-traumatic stress disorder is uh, often associated with Vietnam uh, and Vietnam-era veterans. It caught up to me 15 years later with my, my, uh, my alcohol and drinking problem. I pretty much had, I guess, delayed post-traumatic stress. It, it started about 10 to 12 years when I started really getting into the drugs, sold the house, just started moving. Uh, things started just piling up and, and getting worse and worse. I had bad dreams. She would hear me screaming in the night, what's the matter, what's the matter? And I sleep with a gun under my bed and a machete. No one knows how this feels, peace and reaching out. I helped raise funds for the wall. The first time I went, my legs were rubber. But when I got down to the, I guess they call it the apex, where it meets, I felt 
like I was back in Vietnam with my friends again. I went, even though I will never know this young black kid's name who saved my life, uh, I had to thank him somehow. our shoes and polish our breasts just to kiss some life is ass we like it here we like it here in a we like it here 